What is going on, everyone? Thank you all so very much for listening to this hotline here. Well, I am recording on a Tuesday night here. Well, it was a snowy night last night here. A little bit tired, shoveling snow. Yeah, this is going to be a fucking three months worth of hell, so to say, with winter. But I'm going to man up, and I'm going to... Have to get used to it. So, what are today's topics here on this hotline? Well, we are going to be talking about Garrett Cole. Yes. So, the Yankees are reportedly going to be meeting with Garrett Cole and Steven Strasburg. I'll be talking about that today. Uh, the Seattle Seahawks. Man, last night, Monday Night Football, I actually watched that game over a fucking boring ass, trash ass edition of Monday Night Raw. I'll talk about them Seahawks. I know people want me to talk about Ron Rivera being fired. I already talked about that on the Sunday Hotline Edition after the Patriots lost. I'm not going to be bashing on the Patriots today. Uh, for all you fucking fans out there uh, that were already fucking hating on me. After the loss on Sunday. Who gives a fuck by the way. Um, I still fucking. Support the fucking team. And I'll get into the college football records. I might. Uh, give you my thoughts later on. So. Yeah. So this is uh, the hotline here. For Tuesday December 3rd. 2019. Man. I Three more weeks left until Christmas. Three more weeks. So, I'll be talking about my change of schedule. Of course, uh, this is going to be the last time that I do a Tuesday night hotline for a while. Mainly because we don't have the college football playoff rankings coming out. So, my hotlines will be coming out Wednesday morning. Starting next week. If there are any available sport topics to talk about. And then, of course, you know, Tuesdays, uh, I like to put up the rest of Observer's uh, Monday Night Raw review. Uh, Thursday, I will still be keeping the AEW NXT reviews from the Wrestling Observer. And then whatever pay-per-views that happen with WWE. And then, of course, uh, Sunday, I will be doing the hotlines after uh, football, at least until the end of the season. So, once baseball season starts coming up, man, I'll be doing a lot of the hotlines because I really want this to be more of a baseball-oriented hotline. I might do some breaking news hotlines when it comes to teams or anything major that happens in the world of sports when it comes to a player, but yeah, let's talk about it. The hot stove. Um... First topic that I want to get into. So, Athletic. So, The Athletic talked about this today. The Garrett Cole sweepstakes are starting to accelerate. Even the Steven Strasburg sweepstakes too. The two free agent pitchers, both represented by Scott Boris, will continue to meet with teams in California this week in advance of the winter meetings next week. So, I could see next week's hotlines... Busy as usual because of the winter meetings. And this is according to Major League sources. The Yankees will sit down with both Cole and Strasburg over the next two days, sources said. Other teams already have met with or will meet with the two pitchers who are widely viewed as the best starters in this year's free agent class. Let me just say this about the athletic quick. Why don't you guys have a New York Yankees podcast up on there? You guys have a Boston Bruins podcast that I listen to. You guys have a New England Patriots Dallas Cowboys podcast that I listen to. And a Boston Celtics podcast. Mind you, a Notre Dame podcast as well. But you don't have a New York Yankees podcast... But you got your writers 
talking about the New York Mets and they have their own podcast? You people in the athletic, man, you guys need to fucking hire me. Even though I will fucking cut down the language when I do a podcast. So, like I mentioned here in the beginning of the podcast, hotline, whatever you like to call it. It's December 3rd. December is here. Winter is here after what I talked about with a couple of inches of snow falling here last night. The hot stove season is here. Garrett Cole and Steven Strasburg are in California with Scott Boris. Meeting with teams that are begging them to sign with their baseball franchise. And then comes in Brian Cashman. You know me. The hate that I have for fucking Brian Cashman. And I always fucking say this, you know, fire Brian Cashman. Every year I say, well, the fucking Yankees don't fucking achieve anything. Don't even make it to the World Series. In this decade, you got to go into this new decade having to go to a World Series. Hell, even winning a World Series. But don't get me wrong, Brian Cashman... He's also a wizard. And the guy has been doing this with the Yankees since 1998. A general manager lasting over two decades in this sport. It's crazy, especially in New York. And doing that in New York is as close to impossible as it gets. And he seems to have mastered the bargain market when it comes to hitters. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. DJ LeMahieu. He found a diamond in the rough. Luke Voigt. Mike Talkman. Gio Yashella. Just to name a few of the diamonds in the rough. And what do these four guys have in common? They were afterthoughts. Not even having a real chance proved over the last year. Plus, what happened with those guys? They were in a contending lineup every day. And these guys are going to be impact players next year. And years, hopefully, for the New York Yankees. But the thing that I have a problem with, yeah, he's been great with the hitting. Cashman's problem has been pitching. His inability to go out and trade for a fucking ace. That's always haunted him as a general manager. James Paxson, I'll even say it right now. He's fine as of now. And I kind of feel like there was a little bit of a steal. You know, when he traded for James Paxson. Look at Sheffield. Uh, Sheffield last year struggled for the Mariners. But we're going to have to wait and see what happens to Sheffield's future. And you look at James Paxson. The first half of the season... Not good, but the second half in the postseason, they were promising. But consistency and health are two big unknowns with him moving forward. Cashman has also had success when dropping his nuts in free agency before. CC Sabathia, seven year deal, $161 million. Masahiro Tanaka, Seven years, $155 million. Great signings. And don't tell me, signing guys to long-term deals isn't worth it. Both those pitchers lived up to those deals 
as far as I'm concerned. But right now, the Yankees are going into the season, and this is your fucking starting rotation right now. Luis Severino, James Paxson, Masahiro Tanaka, Jordan Montgomery, and then who is this fifth pitcher for the Yankees? Who is going to be this fifth pitcher? You look at guys like Mike King, Clark Smith, Jahap, Gaman. Even though Gaman's investigation is still going on, you just don't know where he fits right now. Does he even fit with this fucking team? Let's forget about 2020. Let's forget about the start of this season. That's going to happen. Let's get into the future. You look at Tanaka. Tanaka is in the last year of his deal. James Paxton is also going to be a free agent after the 2020 season. Jay Happ has an option for 2020, for 2021. That's going to get triggered if he starts 27 games or throws 165 innings. Let me just say it like this. I don't see either of those signings happening in 2020. If that's the case, the Yankees are going to lose 60% of their starting rotation after next season. Signing Garrett Cole isn't just important for the win now, 2020 New York Yankees. It's really important for the future of the starting rotation. If you sign Cole, that's going to give you Severino and Cole for the next five to seven years and dominance at the front of the starting rotation. That is something similar to what the Astros did for the last three seasons. Every postseason series is going to lead off with those guys. Garrett Cole is everything the Yankees have been missing for the past five seasons. A guy to take the ball and it immediately install fear into the eyes of the hitters. And it also takes that pressure away from Severi to carry the rotation, which I think is going to benefit him immensely. Even before I started doing these hotlines, I was telling people for years, ever, this, ever since the Yankees were first rumored to trade for him back when he was with the Pittsburgh Pirates, I've always thought of Garrett Cole as a Roger Clemens 2.0. I've never been right about anyone more in my life than I was about Garrett Cole. This is a guy that I want so badly for this franchise. I really fucking do, man. I would have done whatever it took back then to get this deal done. Because this guy has all of the makings of being the most dominant pitcher of the next decade. And it's really going to put him as a Hall of Famer. I want this fucking guy, man. This is like me wanting a MacBook Pro under my Christmas tree. As Brian Cashman, Aaron Boone, and Matt Blake, they head to California to meet with these big boys, things feel different than the last few seasons. And I'm going to give you guys an example. The Yankees... Never met with Bryce Hopper. Didn't even entertain the thought of bringing him to the Bronx. And why is that? Because they didn't feel like his personality matched with the Yankees culture. They tried with Machado. But they ended up bringing DJ LeMahieu into our lives. And I don't see a single person complaining about that. I don't see... 
a person saying, oh, we should have gotten uh, Manny Machado. Uh, we should have gotten him over DJ LeMahieu. I don't hear that. I don't fucking hear that. Then you have Patrick Colburn. He was brought in. But the Nationals, they went over the top with their offer. And what happened with that? The Nationals won the World Series. I don't fault the Yankees for refusing to go to $140 million. Zach Wheeler. Um, I can't even say the guy's last name. I just fucking read before I started this fucking hotline that there's a hundred million dollar offer out there for Zach Wheeler. I kind of feel that he's the Yankees' perfect second tier pitcher to disappoint fans with. The Yankees haven't said a word to him or his team. They are after the bigger fish. They're after Garrett Cole. And they've come out and said that, oh, he's their top priority. Something they don't usually do. And this comes from the athletic report too. The Yankees are again making him a priority, so to say. The question is whether Cole, a native of Newport Beach, California, would prefer a comparable deal from a West Coast team such as the Angels, who... I'm fucking concerned about too because I think the Angels, they're also in the fucking running to get a Garrett Cole. Former Astros teammate Josh Reddick predicted during the season that Gar that Cole, I was going to say Garrett Cole, but I'm going to say Cole would sign with a team west of Nevada. Folks, what this is going to come down to is... Location versus winning. Cole grew up in California. Does he value pitching in the sunshine and warmth over a contender? I believe. I mean, even if the Yankees don't sign Cole, I'll even say it like this. They're going to enter... The 2020 season as the odds-on favorite to win the World Series. The Astros will be worse just based on subtraction. Boston, to me, is going to be worse after their, file, after their fire sale. And it's the Yankees' World Series to lose. If they add Garrett Cole, they're going to be... The number one odds-on favorite to win the World Series. They'll enter the season as that evil empire that we've seen in the past. Them against the world. The fuck you Yankees are going to be back. Garrett Cole will never get that kind of chance with the Los Angeles Angels. Yeah, sure. The Angels, yeah, they got Otani. <clears throat> you got, what, the rated MVP in Mike Trout. Let me just say, that team isn't fucking winning the World Series. Maybe they'll be in the postseason a few times. But contending every year isn't realistic. And by the end of the day, Brian Cashman and the Yankees they have no excuse here. If you're not going to abide by any luxury tax mandate, then this is the time to break the bank and get a starting fucking pitcher. It's now or never. If they don't spend the money this year, they never will spend the money. All they're going to fucking do is fuck the fans over. And I will say it in this hotline too. If they don't sign Garrett Cole, I'm already going to say it. If there is a future hotline that I have to do, and this is if they don't sign Garrett Cole, I'm going to say it. All you fucking care is 
fucking putting asses in the fucking seats. That's all you fucking care. You don't care about what the fan has to say. <clears throat> the fan in me. All of these Yankee fans out there. They want Garrett Cole. And my plea to Brian Cashman is to bring us Garrett Cole. Be a hero. Give this franchise number 28. I'm just too deep. Fuck. Now when it comes to Steven Strasburg. I'll say it right now. My guess is that he's going to head back to D.C. So I'm not really entertaining that idea right now. That is my thoughts on what's happening with the New York Yankees. We'll see what happens um, in the future. But I want to get in and I don't want to talk about the winter meetings. Maybe next week in a future hotline video. I might do it next Sunday. After I talk about the Patriots game and then talk about the, uh, what is it, <clears throat> the college football playoff. But I got bigger and better things to talk about. What about that game last night? Monday Night Football. Seattle Seahawks and the Minnesota Vikings. What a game. This game helped the Seahawks last night. And it helped the Seahawks because now they're in first place in the NFC West. You got a position for the number two seed in a first round bye. This team has been playing on fire as of late. Five game winning streak. I'm going to tell you right now. And I actually am going to fucking pull this off if my fucking computer lets me. But I'm going to get into the fucking standards right now. I don't want to talk about the AFC because the fucking AFC, man. I don't even want to fucking talk about the New England Patriots after fucking the piss fucking powerful performance that they did. Yeah, all you fucking Patriot fans out there, like I fucking said... You guys fucking attacked me the other day. You know what? Fucking blow me. Fucking blow me. Suck my motherfucking dick. But I want to talk about the NFC. <clears throat> you look at right now. The first seed is New Orleans Saints. I truly feel that the New Orleans Saints, they want to get to the Super Bowl. Especially what happened last year when they got screwed. Like I mentioned about the Seahawks at number two. Cowboys and 49ers. If the wild card was today, <laughs> the Cowboys would fucking host the 49ers. Oh my god. I don't even want to fucking talk about this fucking game if it were to happen now. And then you got the Packers versus the Vikings. Okay. Here's why I believe that the Seahawks. And I'm going to give you three reasons why this team. They're primed for a Super Bowl run this season. First and foremost, you got an experienced coach and a quarterback. And it's rare to have a head coach and a quarterback who both have experience playing in big games. Two Super Bowls. And making deep runs in the postseason. Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson, they're seasoned veterans in their respective roles at this point in their career. So they will not be rattled once again. And they're going to find themselves in a meaningful contest 
in January. The only other playoff team in the NFC playoff pitcher who could say the same are the New Orleans Saints. Number two, Russian offense. Yes, they're Russian offense. Yeah, they got some fumbling issues. But Chris Carson has had a great season. He's got the eight most rushing yards in the league after 12 games. A change of pace back, uh, Rashad Penny has also started to come along. As of late, he's averaged 101.5 rushing yards per game in his last two games. Running the ball becomes increasingly important as the temperature begins to drop later in the year. And Seattle has consistently proven that they can move the ball on the ground. And additionally, their quarterback can do some damage in the running game. Making them a difficult team to game plan for. And last but not least, winning close games. They have played in several closely contested games this season. 10 of their 12 games thus far, <coughs> excuse me, have been decided by one score or less. And they have emerged victorious in nine of them. Seattle's grit has been tested numerous times and they have managed to come out on top at a high rate. So when the playoffs roll around and they're tasked with some difficult matchups, this is a team that won't be folding under pressure. Three reasons why I just gave you that the Seattle Seahawks, they're primed for a Super Bowl run. Let's get into the Dallas Cowboys. I want to get into this story. I want to talk about Ezekiel Elliott. Continue about the run game of the Dallas Cowboys. The Dallas Cowboys, we all know, were embarrassed. I got to say, this was the worst Thanksgiving I've ever had watching football. Embarrassed on national television by the Buffalo Bills. Their third loss in four games. At 6-6, six and six, the Cowboys somehow are clinging onto the top spot in the NFC East. But they look far less formidable than they did at the start of the year. Offensive coordinator Kellen Moore was employed to breed new life into this Cowboys offense. But for some reason, he has decided to decrease the role of star running back Ezekiel Elliott. And this was a note that I found on Twitter, and I will just share it. Ezekiel Elliott is averaging the fewest touches per game in his four NFL seasons. Jerry Jones, who changed offensive coordinators in search of improvement and creativity, has begun to take notice. Okay. This is something that I talked about a few weeks ago when we fucking lost to the Minnesota Vikings. And you look at Ezekiel Elliott. He's averaged 21.7 carries per game in his first three seasons in the NFL. Look at this number. This number has dropped to 18.9 this year. The lowest mark in his career. He carried the ball just 12 times in that loss to Buffalo. The sixth time he's recorded fewer than 20 carries this season. The Cowboys have the most 
or have the best passing offense in the league in terms of yards per game, that should be translating into more wins. I just don't fucking get it. Why are we fucking 6-6? Six and six? I don't know. I just hope fucking Jason Garrett gets fired sooner rather than later. If the Carolina Panthers can fire fucking Rod Rivera, why can't this freak... Oh, my God. Why can't this fucking franchise, man, fucking fire Je uh, fucking Jason Garrett? And what's killing this team? Why are we 6-6? Six and six? The lack of a run game. ESPN stats and info. The Cowboys are a different team when Ezekiel Elliott is involved more since he entered the league. 16 or more carries. You want to know what Dallas's record is? 31 and 13. 15 or fewer carries. One of their record is 3 and 5. Ezekiel Elliott led the NFL in rushing yards in two of his first three seasons in the league. But after handing him a monster contract, which of course, you know, I had talked about here, the Cowboys have reduced his role. The Cowboys are still primed to make the playoffs out of the NFC East. Fucking blow me on that. Seriously, fucking blow me on that. But if they want to make even the slightest bit of noise, which they won't do, they have to start unleashing Zeke sooner than later. I'm done talking about this. Let's see. What else can we talk about here? Can we talk about the Patriots? Uh, I don't want to talk about the fact that Jerry Jones um, talked about Jason Garrett. Please. Let's see. I don't think I want to talk about the Patriots because I don't want to fucking you know really start a fucking fire up fire up Patriot Station again. But I will fucking say this, you know, people were talking about this the other day during the game. They're talking about the fact that okay, our wide receiver call fucking sucks. Ah, uh, duh! They fucking suck. Why did we let go of Josh Gordon? Okay, I'll talk about that. They fucking let go of Josh Gordon because they didn't want to fucking give him a chance. Okay? And letting him go, that to me was the most confusing decision ever. So, um... I'm going to take a little bit of a break here. When I get back, I'm going to be talking about the college football playoff, the latest rankings, and yes, I am going to bash Alabama yet again. What am I going to be talking about Alabama? Well, the topic that I'm going to be talking about is... The three mistakes that caused them an opportunity of being in the college football playoff. So I will talk about that when I get back. And I will see you guys in just a bit. Alright, so after taking a break, having some supper, and during my supper, the new college football playoff rankings come out for week 15 and here it is because this is the final 
regular season matchups, and there were some shakeups before we get into championship weekend. Top four spots remain the same. I'm going to start it off at number four. Georgia, Clemson's at number three. LSU's at number two. Ohio State is at number one. Outside looking in at five and six, Utah is in at number five. Oklahoma is in at number six. And I'll share the rest of the top 25. Number 25, Oklahoma State. Number 24, Navy. Number 23, Virginia. Number 22, USC. And this kind of surprised me with USC. Because USC fired their head coach this week in a way so they can get Urban Meyer. Appalachian State is at number 21. Cincinnati at 20. Boise State at 19. Minnesota after losing to Wisconsin. They go to number 18. Memphis is at number 17. Iowa at number 16. Notre Dame at number 15. Michigan, number 14. Oregon, number 13. The team that I'm about to roast yet again. Alabama's at number 12. Auburn, number 11. Penn State at number 10. Florida at number 9. Number 8, Wisconsin. And then rounded it off, number 7 is Baylor. So those are your rankings here. And this really brings in a very interesting topic over here that I want to talk about here. Because all eyes are going to be on that final spot in the college football playoff. That number four spot. If you're a Clemson fan, if you're an LSU or Ohio State fan, if any of them win this weekend, they're in the college football playoff. If you're pulling for a different team, you should know exactly which school you want to watch this weekend. And this sucks that I'm going to be able to watch. I hope I can watch this game. LSU versus Georgia. I mean, man, that is the SEC championship, man. I got some... This is going to be a big sports weekend. I can tell you that with the with the championship uh, games, you know, in the conferences. You got the Anthony Joshua fight again that's going to happen. The big rematch. I'm going to miss that game. I'm going to miss most of that SEC championship game because I'm going to Foxwoods uh, this weekend with a bunch of friends of mine. If we have... A stunning loss from either Clemson. I doubt Clemson loses this weekend. I doubt they lose to Virginia. Clemson, to me, is going to win. Ohio State in the Big Ten Championships. Um, Who do they play in the Big Ten Championship game? Uh, They play Wisconsin. If Ohio State loses to Wisconsin... There's one college football playoff spot up for grabs. If you're rooting for Baylor, Oklahoma, or Utah, you guys got to pay attention to this fucking weekend. If all of these four, three of these four teams win, and then Georgia loses... You look at the Pac-12 championship right now. Pac-12 championship game. You got Oregon versus Utah. Big 12 championship game. Oh 
hold on just a sec. I'm trying to get the stats over here. Um, Oklahoma versus Baylor. You know people are going to be wanting to watch that game. Seasons. Look at the spreads here. Clemson, 28.5 point favorite over Virginia. Ohio State is a 16.5 favorite against Wisconsin. Upsets have happened. But I'm going to say this right now. Clemson and Ohio State, they're locked in for the playoffs. I don't care what anybody fucking says. The SEC Championship game. Georgia is a 7.5 underdog to LSU. And if Georgia loses, the other big game to watch is Oklahoma versus Baylor. Or Utah. Because if Utah can beat Oregon, Utah's in the college football playoff. And I'll say this about LSU. LSU... Did this impressive group of top, tw this impressive group right here, because they have, and this is really to me, I really do believe that LSU deserves to be in the playoffs. Why would you say, oh, LSU doesn't fucking deserve to be in the playoffs? They deserve to be in the playoffs. Look, they have defeated Florida, who is number nine. Right now, in these rankings, Auburn, who is number 11 in these rankings, Alabama, who's number 12, you look at their average, 33-point margin of victories in the nine remaining games. Their game against Texas earlier in the season, they were winning 20 points. And if LSU's only setback is a loss to Georgia, especially, and I'm just using this as a fucking hypothetical, if this is a close game, what is the committee going to do? How much are they going to punish LSU? Because conference championships, they have an impact. But there is a precedent for a one-loss team making the playoffs anyways. This committee could determine that LSU is one of the nation's four best teams. Whether you think it should happen is irrelevant, but the fucking facts is right there. Oklahoma and Baylor, at best, they present two top 25 wins. Utah is aiming for its first in the Pac-12 championship game. Oklahoma lost to Kansas State. Baylor has four one-score victories over programs that didn't reach a bowl. And oh, by the way, when you look at fucking Utah, who did Utah lose to? Um, That team that just fired their head coach? USC? Is it possible that the committee will take one over LSU? Sure. That's not a situation that Baylor, Oklahoma, or Utah want to face, though. Because blame the trio's conference affiliations if you like. But LSU has more chances for marquee wins in the SEC, and they took advantage of those opportunities while avoiding a misstep. And even if they are defeated in Atlanta. They're still in the fucking college football playoffs in my opinion. And Baylor, Oklahoma, and Utah. I hope in Georgia doesn't do the same. So let's look at some of the facts over here. Big 12 versus Utah. Since we're fucking talking about this subject, let's assume that LSU wins. Considering the previous rankings, 
the selection committee seems to favor Utah. Through five weeks, Utah has been slotted ahead of Oklahoma in every release. And with that game against Oregon on Friday, I'll watch that game. I'm I'm gonna fucking watch that game. I mean, I love let me just say before I get back to my rambling. I will say it like this. I love conference championship weekend. If Utah beats Oregon, that is their best win of the season. On the other hand, we can't exactly expect consistency from a group with transparency on its ranking process. That much has become obvious week after week for a half decade. Utah passes the eye test. Uh, Utah is ranked ninth nationally at 6 point yards per play. They have scored 30 plus points in 10 games. Plus they lead college football in rushing defense. And they hold top 3 marks in total in scoring defense. However, the committee favors subject metric. On field dominance. Game control. Until it randomly decides to do otherwise. Strictly based on the resume test. Oklahoma or Baylor has the edge. After all, both programs hold more top 25 wins than Utah. And either Oklahoma or Baylor will add a higher ranked victory Saturday. Common sense suggests that if either Baylor or Oklahoma were going to lead past Utah, it should have happened already. But we know better than to suggest that the committee isn't considering a last second switch, especially if Utah doesn't obligate Oregon. Let's talk about Clemson here. Yes, Clemson has had a free ride. Throughout this process. Throughout this season. The fact that. They nearly lost to North Carolina in September. Was a trap game. And during the first half of the season. Trevor Lawrence threw a lot of interceptions. Since then. They have quietly steamrolled every opponent. And earned 7 straight wins of 31 plus points. This is what uh, Dabo Sweeney said the other day. He doesn't think that Clemson has been portrayed properly this year. Says other programs get benefit of the doubt in the way that Clemson does not. By pulling out the disrespect card, Sweeney has accomplished exactly what he wanted. Clemson is a national storyline again. Yes. After they defeated South Carolina. This guy fucking bitches. Fucking complains. That the committee is focused on keeping Georgia in the top four. But they're awaiting a moment to drop Clemson. And. Let's play the game over here. Let's talk about your fucking debate. Your fucking rhetoric that you said. Okay. Ohio State. 4-0 versus top 25 teams. Okay? They're 8-0 versus 6-win teams. LSU. Is 3-0 versus top 25 teams. They've won 8 games. With 6-win teams. Look at you. Look at you for a moment. Mr. Clemson over here. Who wants the fucking bitch. You have not beaten a top 25 team this year. You've beaten seven teams that have won six this year. From an objective standpoint, there's no justification for Clemson being ranked number one. Ahead of Ohio State or LSU. I don't fucking care if you have a fucking 27 game win streak. 
But you said in September that you did not deserve the number one ranking in the polls. It's a new season. And every season should be judged on its own results. Should the Tigers receive the same benefit of the doubt as LSU and Ohio State? Well, the committee thinks so. But look, (coughs) excuse me. Look what Rob Mullen said on ESPN. This is why he said, uh, the difference between Ohio State, LSU, and Clemson is the ranked wins, and the Buckeyes had their fourth ranked win on Saturday. No shit, Sherlock. No fucking shit. We agree. But let me continue this discussion. One problem here is the subjective nature. While the first topic involves a 1-2-3 ranking, the end goal to this question is what is the answer? It's personal preferences. Look at LSU and Ohio State. They have three marquee wins. They're thriving and they're beating top teams. It's not Clemson's fault that much of the ACC fucking sucks. Yet the Tigers, they cannot afford to perform poorly against Virginia. Because your only fucking team that you're playing that's in the top 25 is in the ACC championship. The final issue is Clemson. What happens if they fall to Virginia? They're going to be in the ranks of one-loss teams. And you look at the one-loss teams. Georgia, Utah, Oklahoma, and Baylor. Look at Georgia. Okay, Georgia undefeated. Against top 25 teams. They're 8 and 1 versus 6 win teams. Utah. Like I mentioned, their only loss was to USC when they were a top 25 team. 5 and 1 versus 6 win teams. Oklahoma. 1 and 0 against a top 25 team. 5 and 1. Versus six win teams. Look at Baylor. Baylor. 0-1 versus top 25 teams. Who was that only lost to? Oklahoma. Top 25. That. Alright. I'm getting a little bit confused over here. That 0-1 versus top 25 teams. I did mention Oklahoma. 4-1 versus six win teams. From our perspective, Sweetie, he took aim at the wrong competition. If Georgia can add another top 25 win and go 9-1 against bowl eligible teams, something Sweetie cited as a defense on the ACC's depth, that the Bulldogs would be the most accomplished 12-1 team. Rather, He should be comparing the ACC's depth to both the Big 12 and the Pac-12. Because Clemson has this much greater case to stay ahead of Baylor, Oklahoma, and Utah than it does with Georgia. Because when in that group, the record versus top 25 competition, it's not compelling any one way. You know, see for Oklahoma... Possibly becoming 2-0. and oh. Given Oklahoma's recent tight finishes. While Clemson has dominated its competition though. You could still make that eye test debate in favor of Sweetie's team. And if you're asking me. Clemson. Is indisputably one of the country's four best teams. And that's what Reese Davis and that's what Jesse Palmer said 
during the uh, selection show that happened tonight. Because both the offense and defense, they're elite. And the eye test has matched it except for that one game that they had in Chapel Hill. Trevor Lawrence, you know, he's produced at this great rate over the last six weeks. Uh, the defense has allowed more than 14 points once all season. Sweeney, he doesn't need to convince the media about Clemson. His fucking rhetoric is all about making sure that the committee weighs his team's dominance more heavily than top 25 wins. That's all I gotta fucking say on this fucking subject. Um, definitely there's gonna be a lot I have to say on Sunday when um, we all talk about this. Lastly, I want to troll Alabama. Damn, this has to be the longest fucking hotline that I've had to fucking... I've done in my fucking short time of fucking doing hotlines here. Like we mentioned with Alabama. Number 12. So many people say, oh, it's it's rare that Alabama is not in the college football playoff. This team faltered this season. And they don't deserve to be in the college football playoffs. I'm blaming this season on a couple of things. Nick Saban himself is responsible for a few glaring mistakes this year. And you can make a debate, you can fucking make an argument that the three things that I'm going to talk about should have not occurred. And if those did not happen, of course Alabama's still in the fucking college football playoff talk. Let's not fucking kid ourselves. But I'm going to tell you three reasons why they're not in the fucking college football playoff this year. Number one, leaving Tua in too long versus Mississippi State. Look, the first half seems a bit early to pull a quarterback. But when you have a quarterback that was not 100%, Tua was not 100% in that game against Mississippi State. Hasn't really been 100% since uh, he injured his ankle earlier in the season. And the fact that you had a 35-7 lead, it's safe to say that, you know what, your quarterback has done the job. We're pretty much going to win this game. You're done for the rest of the game. I'll put it in my backup bin. And instead of replacing Tua with Mac Jones ahead of the final drive of the first half, you decide to fucking put Tua in the game. And what happened? Your quarterback had a devastating hip injury, which ended his season. Mind you, killed his stock in the NFL draft. And if he had played in the Iron Bowl, they could have beaten Auburn in the Iron Bowl. I'm just saying that right now. Number two, 12 men on the field at the end of the Iron Bowl. I know this is going to take time for Alabama fans to get over it. But... During a critical final play against Auburn. In which the Tigers lined their punter up as a wide receiver to confuse the tide. Alabama got penalized for having 12 men on the field. Alabama tried too quickly to make a substitution. And that's what happened. They got flagged. 
Something which Saban said was unfair. We talked about that on the hotline this past weekend. Auburn got a first down. They were able to run out the clock. Rather than Alabama getting one last shot in the game. This coaching blunder didn't lose Bama the game. But it prevented them from getting one last shot to leave with a win. And then lastly, you guys got your ass kicked in the first half of that game against LSU. And even Nick Saban admitted to screwing up during that game. A late throw in the first half from Tua was intercepted. And it resulted in LSU get an outstanding field position due to uh, unnecessary roughness. Uh, LSU was already up 13 at the time. But Nick Saban's risk allowed the Tigers to add another 7 points to the scoreboard. And Nick Saban admitted after the game that he should have run the ball in that situation. LSU scored 14 points while taking just 20 seconds off the game clock to end the first half. And it's all because Nick Saban tried to do too much offensively against a fierce defense. There you have it. That's why your sweet home Alabama is not in the college football playoff this year. I'm done with this hotline, man. Man, it's been a long hotline. Fuck it. I'm out of here. Uh, Till then, subscribe to the channel. I am out. Deuces and love.